Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. With the first pick, the Detroit Pistons select Cade Cunningham from Oklahoma State University. To Chandler again. Oh, what a block by Max Seal! Oh, my goodness! The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. There's Jaden playing the passing lane. Sky's a jam. Dunk and the crowd loves it. Pistons need a three and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. He's got it. He's got it. Chauncey Phillips hits the three. Overtime. Amazing. Out of bounds. Detroit Basketball. Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace Pistons podcast part of the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mike Angolano. Joining me this week are both Jasper Apollonia and Aaron Johnson. Fellas, how are we feeling on this uh, suddenly sunny Thursday? Hey, man, we're a week out of the trade deadline. It's a busy, busy time in the NBA season. Let's see what happens throughout this next week. The Pistons have been involved in a lot of different rumors, both on players that are on their roster and players that they might be interested in from other teams' rosters. So very excited to get into everything. And and Mike, you were uh, a close out today for the podcast. So glad you're here and glad we got all three of us on here for today's show. Definitely agreed with that. We we definitely have a lot of stuff to talk about in regards to trades, trades that have happened and the players that were involved in them, trades that might happen, and specifically one trade that did not happen so I'm excited to get into it with the fellas today. Yes, yeah, so we're going to get into all of that and more. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this week's episode, and that is Bet Online. And it's playoff time, and the road to Vegas has been cleared. Uh, we now know the two teams playing. It's going to be the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. Unfortunately, to my two Detroit Lions fans, um, it was a hard-fought game. Uh, I know that there's a lot of opinions on the play calling and the decision making, but um, it was it, it was it was close. I think all of America was rooting for the Lions. Um, Niners Chiefs is 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 the worst possible outcome in terms of uh, excitement. But either way, um, whatever the outcome was, uh, we hope that you'll use our sponsor this week, and that is Bet Online. It's your number one source for playoff football odds, stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads, the hundreds of player performance props, and there will be a ton of them. Uh, for Super Bowl Sunday. So head on over to Bet Online today and stay updated on all the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. Now, before we get into some of our pre trade deadline talk, and we are now one week away from the deadline, as Aaron said, uh, we want to do a couple of plugs uh, for some of the ways that we are reaching all of our listeners. So we have um, a Substack, a Palace of Pistons Substack. We've moved away from our previous outlet we now are on substack so please um, subscribe to our substack the episode uh, description on whatever platform you're listening to you'll have a link to the substack Um, we are also on tiktok you can follow us at at palace of pistons we're posting very frequently on there as well we will hope you'll join us on that site as well and then wherever you are listening apple podcast spotify youtube wherever that may be you know please subscribe Leave us a review, a comment. We do read through them. We we want to have that feedback. We want to cultivate that uh, feedback and, you know, create a little community here. And I think we're starting to really do that. So uh, we would really love to have you aboard uh, as we transition to some different ways to interact with all of you, uh, the fans. And like you, you know, we are fans of the Pistons. We're all just trying to manage whatever the hell is happening with this team together. So we hope that you will join us on the various sites. All right, let's get into a little bit of pre-trade deadline talk. Um, But first, there's a couple of injuries, unfortunately. The Pistons just can't stay healthy. Uh, Isaiah Stewart's out for the next 10 to 14 days with an ankle sprain. And Mike Muscala was placed in concussion protocol after colliding with Evan Mobley in the first quarter of yesterday's game against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, I have a couple of other notes with Jaden Ivey and Jalen Durham being named to the 
rising stars game for all-star weekend uh, notably a star thompson was not invited or maybe not notably based on how his minutes have sort of fluctuated and then killing hayes was a dmp coach's decision on wednesday night despite being fully healthy so before we talk about the, the trade that didn't happen um let's go back to the isaiah stewart and the mike muscala injuries because those are significant you know we've had um some pretty good uh, impact, especially by Muscala being a stretch five and, you know, bringing something to this team that the Pistons haven't had. Um, Jasper, you know, what are the, how are you feeling about the inevitable return of James Wiseman to the rotation with, with both Stewart and Mike Muscala out? Um, Muscala, yeah, I mean, it could be a couple days. He has to go through the NBA's, you know, official um, concussion protocol, but Stewart's going to be out for the next two weeks. Um, so how do we feel about the front court situation for the Pistons? That's kind of been up and down. I mean, it's not ideal that Wiseman's going to be playing. Let's just get that out of the way. And you know that he has his stands that are going to disagree, are going to say it's a shame that he's not in the rotation right now because he's so very good. Uh, but really, I, Mike Muscala has been, I'm not going to say a revelation for this team. I think that's overselling it a little bit. But he's been extremely useful for Detroit since they acquired him in that trade with Washington, as has Danilo Gallinari. Uh, we saw him go absolutely en fuego against your beloved Cleveland Cavaliers. He was he was really killing it as that small ball five. Uh, Muscala being out and Stewart being out is pretty bad news for Detroit's defense. Those two guys have been really good on the defensive end. Um I believe they are one and three respectively on the team in terms of their on off splits when it comes to defensive rating. So they've really both been crucial uh, to Detroit's defense. Obviously, Mescal has been there last time, but what he brings you in terms of spacing has been really important as well. I know that what's most likely to happen is that James Wiseman re enters the rotation. Uh, probably not as a starter. I would guess perhaps a Sar Thompson gets those opportunities first. Thank God Isaiah Livers isn't on the team to soak up those minutes anymore. But I think really like they should be looking at Gallinari playing that small ball five, perhaps even starting next to Durin. I, I don't know how feasible that is, but I think it's certainly a possibility. It's a shame about Stewart for sure. I mean, 10 to 14 days, he's he's been banged up this year. And look, while we have our criticisms of him and the role that he's been asked to provide for Detroit, he has been one of their best players in terms of on-court impact. Uh, they really fall apart defensively when he's not on the floor. So I think that this is a very unfortunate injury, especially with Cade Cunningham presumably returning to every game action moving forward. Um, you you really would like to see this team just stay healthy and stay all together for once. It just seems like that can never happen. I believe something like the core of, of uh, Cade, Ivy, Asar, Durin, Stewart, I think those guys have played something like 80 minutes together this year. It, it's really been a struggle to keep all of them on the court with each other. So, you know, it's not a back-breaking thing. At this point, you have five wins, so your back's already broken like Ivan Drago snapped you in half. But it's definitely a shame, uh, especially in regards to those two. Yeah, I think what, what I would say here is, A, James Wiseman should never touch the court for the Pistons. I, they could be down to their last player. I wouldn't play James Wiseman. I'd do what the Pistons did. Uh, when when COVID hit the team a year or two ago, and they just called up like six guys from the G League team, and I'd play all those guys ahead of James Wiseman. But I don't even think the Pistons have to play Wiseman here. I, I I think arguably their best fit right now, as much as I like to to come on here and say a stars to just slide into the starting four spot, I just don't think it works right now. Uh, with with him and Duran in the, in in the front court, there's just not enough spacing on the court, and I can't come on here and say, you know, I want that to happen when I've been so against starting Stewart and Dern, that wouldn't be fair. It just wouldn't be, uh, you know, it'd be saying 
the the opposite of what I've said all year, essentially. So I, I as much as I'd like it to be Thompson, I don't think the fit's there right now uh, until the Pistons get better at shooting and, and those guys become better offensive players. I think the fit right now is Kevin Knox. I mean, he, he shoots the ball from the outside. He can attack a defense a little bit, has a little bit of versatility on the defensive end. Like, is he a world beater at anything? No. But just in terms of fit, like, we, we've seen what – putting a, a floor spacer out there like Mike Muscala can do for this offense, despite him really not being all that super, super talented. It's just his archetype is, is what is impactful for this team. So I think you have to go to Kevin Knox and then you have a star Thompson who comes off the bench. You have Danilo Gallinari who in 2024 led the Detroit Pistons in scoring in a game with 20 points on Wednesday night and did not miss a three pointer while doing it. So between uh, starting Kevin Knox, bringing in Asar Thompson, bringing in uh, Danilo Gallinari. I think that's how the Pistons are going to have to try to maintain that front court rotation between the four and five moving forward. I, I like that idea of actually what you just said there, Aaron. I, I think the idea of like bringing in Asar off the bench next to Gallinari, you can maintain spacing throughout. If you want to, you know, stagger minutes with Gallinari and Duran, put them on the floor together at times, you can as well. I think that's a good idea. I like where you're coming from with that. I mean, really, though, I, I think we're all in agreement. Gallinari, for his flaws at, what, 34 years old, injury prone, old, can't play defense. He's been impactful for Detroit when he's had a chance to play, yeah? And I think that it kind of just drives home the point of what we've been trying to say since the off season, which is that this team desperately needed veteran help, especially in the front court. And now I think with Mascala and Gallinari, you're really seeing what players like that can bring to your team, even if they are not super talented and are very fl- So to answer your question about the core guys playing together, they have played a grand total of 85 sessions um the the difference efficiency is not worth noting <laughs> it's 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 low because of the lack of shooting um but we've already touched on that you know between asar and Stu and duran and kate and ivy you really have three guys who are not reliable shooters and like three and a half who really aren't reliable because sometimes ivy can can shoot and sometimes he can't so um yeah they haven't played a whole lot together i can't get too angry at a fellow Paisano for nearly killing the Cavs last night, but he he really <laughs> he did what I know he uh, really yeah, did um, exactly what he has done his entire career. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. What, Aaron? This is a podcast that will always respect the Italians that can hoop. All of us have the Italian blood in us. We we respect the good. <laughs> you could put Luigi Dottome on this roster. I would do it in a heartbeat. Oh. Italian loving basketball podcast. Bring over Prochida. Bring over Prochida. <laughs> I forgot yeah. he existed. Wow. <laughs> wow. Will he ever come over? Okay, that's another topic. Yeah. Right, we gotta move along here. That's another topic. That that seems like a May topic when we are just scraping the bottom of the barrel. But exactly. um Gallinari, Gallinari provides the shooting that you know we've said this team craves. Um and desperately needs. And guess what? That was the best shooting game that the Pistons have had all season. Um, their second best one was from a game earlier in January, like the fourth or fifth or something, I think against the Bucks. Um, they shot 57% from three against the Cavs. It almost knocked them out. The Cavs don't allow that many threes. They allow the eighth fewest threes um, in the league. They they do allow a very high percentage of those threes to, to hit, but they don't allow many of them. So, Hey, the fact that the Pistons were able to get some shots off and improve their spacing, and they nearly took out you know another team that they were heavily um, underdogs against with the Thunder one, and then I think they were twelve and a half point underdogs against the Cavs. So I think with Stuart Muscala out, you know Gallinari having an opportunity, Kevin Knox, as as we said a couple weeks ago, he's the best, you know, he's, he's a more fitting option right now than a SAR just because he can stretch the floor. He's willing to shoot and do those things to spread out the offense. So um, it'll be interesting to see what the rotations look like from Monty here on out uh, with, with those injuries. Um, okay. Let's move on to our next 
little subtopic here for pre-deadline. You know, Jay Ivey and Jalen Duran were named to the Rising Stars game. Star Thompson was not invited. Are you one of the people um, just abhorrently against a SAR not being named to that? Or does it kind of make sense? I mean, Aaron, I think you've, at least in our chat, you've been kind of in the, Asar is not not as good right now as Quentin Grimes, I think is what I saw you put in like a, a couple days ago. Are you upset that Asar was not invited? I mean, you look at the roster and you look at the rookies that were taken, and I, I'll say that I'm I am a little surprised Asar wasn't named just when I look at some of the other guys that that made it. But at, at the same time, the Pistons have two representatives there, Ivy, who has somehow made it on the roster despite all of the shenanigans he's gone through this year. Uh, it, it deservedly so made it as a sophomore, and Jalen Duran made it as well. So it's like, yeah, does it does it suck that that Thompson isn't there? It it does, but. It's a, a trivial game at, at NBA All-Star Weekend. I'm sure the league also weighed the – they were trying to get representatives in all of the events from as many different teams as possible. So every team has reputation at All-Star Weekend at some way, in some way, shape, or form. So the Pistons have two guys in it, and that's the takeaway. I think the cool thing is, oh, who is it? It's Jalen Rose. So – Jalen Rose, obviously very deeply connected to to the state of Michigan, Michigan basketball, and also a very, very uh, vocal Pistons fan is coaching one of the teams in uh, the Rising Stars showcase. So I think the most interesting storyline is can can we get Jalen Rose to coach Jaden Ivey and Jalen Duran? That's probably the, the biggest takeaway I have from it. How do we make that happen? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this. I mean, look, if a star Thompson had made it, would it have been some big, you know, snub to somebody else? No. I think there was an argument for him over Kuibali. I think maybe an argument for him over Derek Lively even. But but let's be honest. Exactly like you said. Like, they're trying to get different players from different teams in there. Duran and Ivy had to be on that sophomore team roster. They just had to be at this point. And Asar, while he started off the gate really, really strong, I just don't think the playing time has been there. The consistency in his play has been there. Would I love to see him get out on like an all-star team and just run up and down the floor and dunk? Sure. But let's be real. The thing that he brings most of the Pistons right now is defense. And that's not exactly something NBA all-star games are are known for uh so yeah I, I don't really have an issue with the star missing it i think he was borderline at best you could have maybe taken him over somebody else but then i think those players would have also have had an argument in their favor too so nah i'm i'm happy about it i'm happy to see duran and ivy two of the pistons three best athletes get up and down the court for an all-star game uh i'm i'm expecting big things out of one of them i i think Jaden Ivey, if he's given a chance to really do something with the ball in his hands, I think it could be a fun little night for Detroit fans uh, in that regard. And, and Jalen Duran as well. I mean, shoot, if they're just going to run pick and roll all day for this thing, like he's going to get his points and he's definitely going to get his rebounds. So it just comes down to playing time. Um, yeah, I think it's well-deserved. And I don't really feel all that strongly about Asar not making it. Just, just to be completely honest, like, I think Marcus Sasser almost had as good an argument as him. And I don't think Marcus Sasser uh, is going to be on that, you know, anywhere close to there either. So, yeah, I, I have no issues. You know, um, you said that this isn't running up and down and dunking, but what is Mac McClung doing there <laughs> as part of the G League team or, uh, you know, the six or seven G League guys? He's a draw, man. Um, that's like watching, man. that's a, I know. He's he's like a quirked he's, up he's white a good boy. Draw. People, people want a quirked up white boy on the team. <laughs> did, he, did he win the dunk contest <laughs> last year? He did. He did. So um, he did. Yeah. Why he's back he did. Is, well. I mean, twenty five points a game, and he won the dunk contest last year. So yeah, just put him on there. Let him throw down a couple sick yams. Yeah, it's like who else? Are yeah. You the G League Ignite have like six guys, and I don't think they've won a game this year. So it really doesn't matter what the G League's bringing. <laughs> Jer Jared right. Roden snubbed. Um, now that's what we should no, talk about. That's the narrative we need to start putting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. His minutes have just fluctuated too much. I mean, if if you would have told me that, like in July um, after Summer League that he wouldn't make the Rising Stars game, I would have thought, what happened? Well, Monty Williams happened, and the rotations just kind of didn't really allow for him to um, continue playing as well as he did in the Summer League. I mean, he was all over the place in Las Vegas. Um, athletic, defensive, um, throwing down dunks. So... I think putting in that context, it was a little bit surprising, but seeing how the season's played out so far, I'm not really too worked up about it. I mean, I don't normally watch the Rising Stars game that much either, maybe a little bit here and there, but um, yeah, I think the guys ahead of him were, are deserved as well. And, you know, the NBA is trying to showcase a lot of teams, like like you guys said. It's awesome. All right, let's talk about Killian Hayes. I'm sorry, go ahead, Aaron. I was just going to say, it's, it's also a little tough when you're playing – 12 minutes a game at, at times to, to make a big enough impact to get that, yeah. that selection as well. It's true. You better have a really good 11 to 14 minutes. <laughs> um, right, so right, let's talk about Killian Hayes. Yeah, I, I am. I'm excited about this one. So Killian Hayes was a DMP coach's decision on Wednesday night against the Cavs. He was healthy. Um, that's the first time he has missed a game while being fully healthy this season. So a report from James Edwards, the third of the athletic came out today, yesterday, for those of you listening, right before Monty Williams arrived to coach the Pistons with his gigantic pile of money, like Scrooge McDuck, the Pistons had a trade lined up to move Killian Hayes, but upon Williams's hire, he was intrigued by the potential of Killian and wanted to see if he could amplify his development. So the Pistons held off on trading him. Um, this was reported. I don't know if the athletic had this or not, but I've heard this from a couple sources that uh, he and the Pistons were very far away on extension talks this off season. So Killian was a DMP coach's decision. Monty Morris took a lot of those minutes, which we advocated for, uh, you know, last week, why is Killian Hayes playing? It should be Morris. Uh, so we got that Marcus Sasser was playing over him as well. Um, Jasper, you wanted to, you know, you mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast about Killian being a DMP CD and, and what that means and what does that outlook uh, appear to be for him on the team. You want to you want to talk about your feelings on maybe the end of the road for Killian Hayes. And I remember us talking about him being drafted, being very excited. And now he's a a guy who can't get on the court for a team that has six wins. Yeah, I'm assuming the extension talks went something like this. Killian Hayes said, hey, I'd like an extension. And the Pistons said, no, thank you. That's that's what I'm assuming <laughs> the talks kind of went down like. Uh, yeah, I think that this is necessary. It's been a long time coming. Uh, it's one of those things. And you plug the sub stack at the beginning of the show. I'm going to have a, a little article coming out on the Cade and Ivy pairing. There's been a lot of talk about that. Um, it, frankly, it's ridiculous that it took as long as it did for Jaden Ivy to solidify his st spot in the starting lineup uh, and to actually get some responsibilities with the ball in his hands. I think the numbers I'm, I'm going to put forward in that, uh, in that article are going to be a little eye opening, uh, especially when you see what putting the ball in Jaden Ivy's hands has done for this team. But in regards to Killian Hayes, this makes a lot of sense, actually, because at the beginning of the season, even moving forward into the season, we were like, why is this guy still playing? Why is he starting over Ivy? And I, I think with this report, it kind of confirms what we already knew, which is that Monty Williams, even before he came into this organization, had some sort of, you know, crush on Killian Hayes. Um, luckily he'll be able to afford the dowry for Killian when he marries his, his daughter, which is great. Love that. Thank you, Tom Gordis. You're bringing families together every single day, uh, even as you split your own apart. Uh, and I think really what, you know, this means is exactly like you said, it's the end of the road for Killian Hayes. There's just nowhere to go from here. It, the numbers are slightly better than what they've been in years past but they're still so far below forget what you need from a starting point guard like even a backup point guard he could do some things in terms of passing he plays okay defense even though i would argue his defense has 
gotten worse over the last couple of years. Like I thought he was much better defensively last season than he has been this year. There's just with Morris back with Sasser being able to provide spacing with Ivy being able to be the dynamic combo point guard type of guy that he was towards the second half of last year. Now more often Kate Cunningham healthy. There's just no space for, for a guy who doesn't provide spacing can't get to the rim who doesn't draw fouls uh who doesn't really do anything other than pass and defend at a slightly above league average level there's just nowhere to go from here and you have other now younger players who are more deserving of playing time you have to get your veteran marcus Mar- marcus uh monte morris out there as well it, it was necessary it was time and i'll be honest they might not be able to find a trade suitor for him. It's kind of frustrating to know that they did have a trade worked out before the season because I remember us all coming together and being like, what is this guard rotation going to look like? Now we know why it looks like that. It wasn't supposed to. Killian Hayes was going to be gone. And and now we know that it's not going to work out. Monty Williams is over it. And uh, to be honest, if he's not traded at the deadline, I wouldn't be shocked if he's bought out even because it's not really a a big number for the Pistons. um, And there's no point in him wasting his time on on a team that he's not going to get any opportunities for moving forward. So it's unfortunate. You you hate to see it kind of end like this and have it go the way it did, but it's time. Yeah, my, my dream trade here uh, that I, I published in a piece on our Substack earlier this month, well, last month now, uh, in January, was to the Spurs. Spurs need a point guard. They need anybody. They need anyone that can handle the ball and pass the ball a little bit uh, with Victor Wembanyama on the court. So my my ideal scenario is that the Pistons can somehow get Doug McDermott, who's kind of in and out of the rotation over there, not on a big contract, so going to be an unrestricted free agent. I can't remember if it's – this offseason or next but the point is the Pistons get an actual guy that can space the court kind of like the idea of Joe Harris but actually a guy that can give you some minutes and Killian gets a chance to go play somewhere else I will say this like although I would have been pushing if I were the Pistons to make that trade I'm okay with the idea of like Monty Williams coming in who at the time had all the respect in the world and saying, Hey, look, I like what Killian, like I like some of the things that I saw from Killian uh, in his first couple seasons in the league. I'd like a chance to see if I can right some wrongs here and figure it out. It's just, it shouldn't have been at the expense of Jaden Ivy, right? It, It shouldn't have been at the expense of a guy coming off a really strong rookie year was drafted to be the backcourt partner alongside Kate Cunningham. And it just the way things played out are are what really soured me on this whole Monty Williams, Killian Hayes situation. If Killian would have been, you know, if Killian would have came off the bench to start the season and was playing 16 minutes a night and doing the nothing that he has done with all of his minutes this year and been out of the rotation 15 to 25 games in, then we can say, okay. He had his chance. There's not been any real improvements. Monty Williams tried. It hasn't worked out. You know, there would have been the opportunity to to do that, obviously, with Monte Morris out until late January. So it's just how this whole situation was approached that that's rubbed me the wrong way. I actually don't have a problem at all with Monty Williams coming in and saying, look, let me try to fix this. I, I like some of the things. It's just how he actually went about trying to fix the situation it just doesn't make sense that Killian Hayes was seemingly just straight up prioritized over Jaden Ivey that's that's my issue with it yeah I mean like that's the whole issue though with Monty Williams isn't it he just goes about things in such a ass backwards pardon the term manner in in so many of these situations like like you exactly just said it's great. You want to come in. You want to say, hey, I'd like to see what I can get out of Killian Hayes. I'd like to see Jaden Ivey improve his defense, cut down on bad turnovers. That's great. But he went about it in such a mega maniacal fashion. Like, 
just completely buying into his preconceived notions and instead of allowing Killian to improve by perhaps bring him along slowly as a backup point guard, which is his future in the league. If he has any, he threw him right into the fire. And instead of, you know, bringing Jaden Ivy along slowly and being like, look, we're going to work in your ability to handle the ball. He just sat him in the corner and put him on the bench. So that's the real issue, I think, here. Exactly like you said, Aaron. Totally fine that Monty Williams came in and said, hey, this is a guy I'm interested in seeing if I can get something out of. There's no issue there. It's just how he goes about things that is really the issue here. And it has been since day one, unfortunately. Right. Aaron, to answer your question on Dougie McBuckets, he's making $13.8 million this year. He's an unrestricted free agent next year. His hit would be... 20 mil, but they're obviously going to pick that up. So math will work out, um, but do need a shooter. I don't mind that trade at all. Um, I would be surprised if you get something okay for Killian. Um, it's just hasn't worked out, and this seems to be the beginning of the end if it hasn't been the beginning for a couple of months now. So um, Unfortunate, but you know what? With the way that Monty's been having his rotations, it wouldn't be surprised to see Killian right back in it <laughs> next game. The way that he goes back and forth, um, which which would be odd and disappointing. But um, this time next week, we might be talking about uh, Hayes being shipped off as part of a trade deadline deal. And speaking of the trading deadline, that's our next topic for today's show. We're going to do a preview of the Pistons try to put together all of the rumors that have been swirling about what they're going to do at the deadline. Players they could ship out, players they could bring in. Um, we do have a post on our sub stack about this, guys that you know could come and save the Pistons. We're not really sure if somebody is going to come and save the Pistons this offseason. It still seems like that's a summer 2024 type of deal, but you know we will, uh, we will see. The deadline tends to bring out just some wacky stuff randomly when you least expect it. Um, but the two players that, you know, I think are probably most likely to be traded, um, even though Bogdanovich is still, I would say unlikely the Pistons are, you know, have a desire to keep him as a vet who could shoot. Uh, but Boyan Bogdanovich and Alec Burks continue to get trade interest from, uh, more competitive teams that are angling to, uh, put together a roster for the playoffs. The Pistons want a first-round pick and a player for Bogdanovich, or at least reportedly want a first-round pick and a player for Bogdanovich. Uh, and then the Athletic reported that two really good uh, second-round picks could be enough for Detroit to move Alec Burks, who has been on a tear for the last several weeks shooting the basketball and could help several teams out. Um, let's start there, and then we'll, we'll go on to the rest of the players. Bogdanovich and Burks. I feel like we talked about Bogdanovich being traded now for 18 months straight. Um, Literally since he became, is, is, since became a Piston. Literally since he joined the team. We were talking about. So one of the Pistons flipping boy on Bogdanovich. Yeah. Well, look, right. I, let, let's start um, there. Right. Let's, let's start there. I think with Bogdanovich, the thing is, are you getting your asking price? And if you're not getting some sort of good young player and first round pickback, it's really probably not worth it trading him. Like if, if you're saying, Oh, you can get a couple good seconds for him. It just doesn't make sense. He's under contract for another year. We're hearing the same story of they want to be better next year. You need the players to do that. It makes sense to keep Bogdanovich again. A, a trade that I've thrown out uh, on the palace of Pistons. TikTok is Quentin Grimes, the Detroit Pistons first round pick that the New York Knicks currently hold and Evan Fournier for Boyan Bogdanovich. And Alec Burks, I think, to make salary work. I had Ryan Archie Diacono in there from New York as well. So though that's that's a trade that I think makes sense. Some people on the TikTok don't that were following us or watched the video on TikTok don't understand uh the the reasoning behind getting that first round pick back. The point of it is the Pistons can't trade any of their first round picks up until 2028. So they're 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 the first round pick that they can move right now, the closest one that they have is 2029. It's someone telling me that it happens all the time that that a team is going to trade a, a first round pick that's half a decade out uh, to to improve the roster. It just doesn't happen. No other team is trading for a first round pick five years out. You have no idea if you're even going to be alive in five years, let alone if you're still going to be the GM of a, of a team. So it just doesn't make any sense. So the Pistons are trying to get that pick back. 
uh, to give them flexibility to trade any of their first round picks within the next five years. And they get back Quentin Grimes, who's a young player, 22, can shoot the basketball, can play defense. Is he the biggest? No, but does he help this team? Absolutely. You have to look at it from the standpoint of you'd be getting back the flexibility that Troy Weaver has said this team has, but really doesn't, and getting a young player back uh, while you're losing Burks, who's an unrestricted free agent at the end of this year anyway. So even if you want to re-sign him, there's no guarantee it's possible. And then, yes, you do have to give up Bogdanovich because there is true value in getting back a player like Quentin Grimes and that first-round pick. The first-round pick is just so much more valuable to Detroit than it is New York, who has multiple other first-round picks, including some from other teams. And those are first-round picks that are way more likely to convey this year or next year uh, rather than Detroit's, which by the time it ends up conveying, it might end up being second-round picks. Uh, due to all of the protections on it throughout the next two, three, four seasons, whatever it is at this point. So that's the pit, the trade that I threw out. Uh, I'd be okay with this team trading off of Alec Burks for uh, a couple second round picks at this point. I would like them to be good second round picks. I don't really know how you quantify that or, or qualify that at this point. As long as it's to open up minutes for Marcus Sasser, if this is some sort of uh, – plan to get Killian Hayes back in the rotation, then you keep Alec Burks because I also wouldn't hate the idea of re-signing Alec Burks in the summer to a cheaper contract. So I'm not too, uh, too one way or the other on Burks. I, I'm fine if they can move him for some value. I'd also be fine if they kept him with the intention of re-signing him uh, in, in the offseason. The, the, the bigger one is obviously Bogdanovich. Do not use him in a Zach Levine trade. Uh, if you're going to trade him, you, you, you've got to be getting back something of real asset value and I don't know if Detroit's going to get the price that, that, that they're asking for. Remember, they were asking for two first-round picks last year. They didn't get it. They held on to them. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if we're kind of in the same scenario as last year. You know I'm in favor of that Knicks trade you've thrown out there, Aaron, for exactly the reasons you've outlined. I think it's just kind of a no-brainer. Like, you talk about flexibility – that is the number one way to ensure that you have actual flexibility moving forward if you can trade your first round picks. Um, until then, it's just in limbo. So I think that'd be a great deal for New York as well, a team that's really trying to make a push for the playoffs and, and do something in the playoffs this year. I think it'd make a lot of sense for them. Uh, Bogdanovich, I'm, I'm totally fine with holding on to as well. Look, you got him for $20 million next year. Uh, if you're trying to get better, he is a player that regardless of the role that he's in is going to help your team next season. Like as a shooter, he's absolutely going to, whether it's off the bench or still in the starting lineup, you know, just seeing how things kind of work out this off season. I think that that's something I totally would be comfortable with. Burks, I think has to go. You have to trade him. Uh, you're, I don't see him re-signing in Detroit necessarily. And even if he does, if your goal is to get better, I don't necessarily see where a ball dominant, mostly shooting guard in Burks fits into that equation. I just think that he is, he just does too much for, for this team. Like at least he tries to do too much for this team. We saw a great example of that against the, the Cavs when like, you know, Jaden Ivey had a, a pick and roll opportunity. Monty Williams calls that timeout, puts Alec Burks in the game, and then you get a shot clock violation out of it. It's just too much with him and Cade and Ivey and Bogdanovich. I just think there's too many cooks in the kitchen with Alec Burks on this roster. You do need second round picks. I, I still think, like, even though Troy Weaver is deathly averse to actually taking players with the second round picks that he has. If you are going to get a new GM, I'd like the cupboard to at least be a little bit stocked. I'm not saying you got to have a four course meal in there, but shoot, give a dude some Doritos at least. Um, I think that that is what I'm looking at right now. I don't really have any interest in keeping Burks on this roster past the deadline. I think there's too many other guards. You can use Marcus Sasser. You can use Monte Morris. You can you can play along with with Cade and Ivy a little bit off ball. I just don't I don't see the use of him moving forward. I think that there's more value in the picks that you could acquire with somebody like Alec Burks. Bogdanovich, 
like you said, I, I think the trade needs to be right. It can't be for somebody like Levine, who's going to muck up your cap, uh, hurt your flexibility moving forward, and and be a long term commitment. Let's be honest. I just I'm fine with holding on to Bogdanovich. You can still move him during the trip. You can still move him during the off season. Like you can trade him for maybe a late first round pick if you really like somebody there, uh, and you can also trade him before next year's trade deadline. So I'd rather keep that flexibility. Burks, I'm good. Thank you. I've seen enough. Your your time here is uh, appreciated, I guess. The one thing I'll add to that is, uh, yes, it would be good for Detroit to get some assets back. Uh, Troy is not keeping what his asset collection will look like for the next GM in mind. He's looking to make moves that will keep his job, I am sure. Even And, and, and there might be, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but there might be a, a message from leadership that, hey, you don't need to make a big move to save your job this deadline. Uh, and that's why I'm holding on hope that Zach Levine, who we're going to talk about, doesn't become a Detroit Piston. But uh, Troy is going to be looking to try to salvage his job, even if that means he doesn't have to uh, make a big move. But that's what makes me wonder, uh, how does he approach Burks? Like, is him a acquire- I would imagine if they do trade him to acquire picks, uh, he's doing that with a sense of confidence that he's going to be around uh, next season. Let's be real. If they didn't fire him after a 28 game losing streak, my, and, and with everything Tom Gorris has said, my guess is he basically has a guarantee that next year is the last year he has in Detroit. And I'll give Tom Gorris, I think, a little bit of credit on, on that front to be like, look, don't make this huge trade to try and save your job like Stan Van Gundy did. Like, let's go about this in a smart way. I'm going to give you a little bit more time. You're running out of time, but you do have a little bit more time in front of you. So I'm hoping that is how they're approaching this at this point, even if I have very little faith. in. So I actually think that's a good approach because had – Weaver been given the impression that he's got to make a move. I think we would, there would be a higher chance of a Zach Levine um, pressure move. Um, let's just talk about Levine now. Um, and we've talked about it before and this should be pretty quick, but the Pistons have been linked to Zach Levine. They've been linked to DeJounte Murray of the Atlanta Hawks. Seems like Murray to the Lakers was a little bit closer. Talks uh, started to stall out because of D'Angelo Russell playing well, which is an insane sentence to say um to not trade for somebody because of d'angelo russell getting hot for a few weeks but um the pistons have been linked to both murray and levine we've talked extensively about levine on this show and how we don't think that that would be the right course of action what if you guys said definitely don't give up bogdanovich definitely not give up a core four guy for zach levine under any circumstances most because of the money the injury history and i just don't necessarily think his fit with all these young guys taking shots away from Cade and Ivy, you know, and whatnot. It's not conducive to developing a team, but if he is, let's just say he's salary filler, um, essentially like a, like, let's say he's like Bradley Beal, that sort of trade, but even less, I mean, people were very surprised by what Bradley Beal went for, but the contract's just so bad. And that's, it's such an albatross, but if he's there for a salary dump, essentially, um, and you're just giving up Harris Wiseman and stuff to make the numbers match. Are you still opposed to getting Zach Levine or, or would you be more on board with that as a vet to come in and maybe win a couple of games? I'm not because what does the fit look like there? I mean, you're talking about bringing in another guard who, even if you pigeonholed into a three guard lineup and played him as like a three or quote unquote or whatever, like you have Kate Cunningham who needs the ball. They're already struggling to get him and Jade and Ivy involved together on the court. Bringing in a guy like Zach Levine just makes that so much more difficult. And the long-term money that you're committing to him just makes no sense. You want to pay him $49 million in his age 31 season in 2026, 2027. Uh, I sure as heck do not. I don't want to pay him the $40 million he's making right now. The bottom line is Zach Levine does some good things. His teams do not win. And and this year's Chicago Bulls are the greatest, greatest example of that. And it's the most recent example of it. So you have to buy it for what it is. Kobe White is breaking out for them in in his, what, fifth season in the league? 
and putting up insane numbers. He had, I think, 35, 9, and 7 against the, the Charlotte Hornets on Wednesday night. And it's because Zach Levine's off the court. Other guys are getting involved. Other guys are getting a greater opportunity, and it's working out for them. So I just don't look at Zach Levine's production and say, look, this is a guy that I want to pay nearly $50 million to in a few years when I have to start thinking about this upcoming offseason giving Kate Cunningham his rookie contract extension. That will probably be a max deal. Then you have in the up, upcoming offseason, next offseason rather, Jaden Ivey and Jalen Duran, who will be extension eligible. Soon enough, it'll be Asar Thompson. And it's like, is this how you want to spend your cap space? Do you want to lock in these young guys with Zach Levine and that be your roster? And I just don't think that's what the Pistons should be doing. Uh, Troy Weaver's been a big proponent of flexibility. Whether the Pistons have had it or not, it's up for debate. They can have up to $60 million in cap space this summer, giving them a lot of flexibility to do stuff with and navigate the trade market with. Uh, as well as free agency, but the free agency market is incredibly poor, so I wouldn't really be all too concerned there. Um, so, no, I, I don't want the Pistons to to mortgage their flexibility and bring in a guy that just has not produced winning basketball uh, when this team is already in the shape that it's in. I, I think it's this simple in some ways. Like, who thought DeJounte Murray was going to be on the trade block as aggressively shopped as he is right now at the beginning of the season? I think very few people and a big part of why I'm not necessarily interested in trading for Levine is one of those reasons, like we've been saying for years now, guys get traded all the time. Free agency is dead. JJ Redick just said it like a couple days ago on his podcast. Free agency is dead. It's not a real thing. Guys sign extensions and then they get traded when they're not happy with the situation. That's how the NBA works these days. And so there are going to be other opportunities for, for players that, fit what you're trying to do here better than Levine who perhaps have equally onerous contracts but are less risky with his injury history uh and and the fact that he's going to be 33 by the time that contract uh runs out I believe um I, I just yeah we we've talked about it I think we've made our feelings clear I'm really not into the idea of Levine especially as Cade and Ivy seem to finally be getting that opportunity to gel together and are actually doing some positive things on the court. I don't know if you know this, since Jaden Ivey entered the starting lineup on a permanent basis, uh, Cade and Jaden two-man lineups has a positive net rating. Like, they are winning those minutes with the two of them. And I just don't what think that that's something you can... I'm sorry? What a concept. I, I know. Shocking. I know. You, you give two guards who are dynamic in different ways the opportunity to play off each other in a starting lineup instead of sitting the, one of them in the corner and yanking him off the court anytime he tries to do anything other than score at the rim or shoot a three. Uh, good things can happen. Who would have thought? Uh, novel concept, I know. But really, like the idea of adding Zach Levine into that partnership, which is just starting to take place and just starting to come together. I just think it's a recipe to really muck up the best thing this team has going for them, in my opinion, which is Kate Cunningham and Jade and Ivy and their potential pairing together. So no, I'm not, not interested in it. Uh, especially if it would require you trading away Jade and Ivy in order to pull that off. I don't think Detroit's interested in that. Uh, and, and to be honest, I don't know if Chicago is really all that interested in, in, in taking a, you know, Bogdanovich Burks for Levine thing or Bogdanovich and Wiseman. Like, I, I don't know if that really does anything for them either. Like, how does that make them necessarily a, a better team moving forward? So as we're approaching the trade deadline, to me, it's starting to look like there might be another small move. I love your Killian Hayes for Doug McDermott idea, Aaron. Like, shoot, with with Muscala and Stewart out, wouldn't it be sure be nice to be able to throw, instead of Kevin Knox into the starting lineup, Doug McDermott instead? I personally would like that, and I think that that is more the type of move they should be looking to, to make right now. Maybe you package Burks and Killian. Maybe you trade them separately. But the way I'm looking at it with the way that the trade market has kind of borne out, it's going to be small moves at the deadline. And like we said, hopefully it's it's been a case of 
Tom Boris being like, look, Troy, don't make that panic move. I'm going to give you another at least off season, uh, probably through the trade deadline next year to figure it out. But like, don't, don't sell the farm. So right now, like this is not the time, this is not the thing. And I think that's a smart move from Detroit's front office, which is not a statement I've said all that often. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the smaller moves or unless you guys have anything on uh, Murray who would cost more, better fit, same deal. It ain't happening. It's just not happening. Like I, I'm, I'm yeah. more interested than I am in Levine. But at this point, if it seems like unless you're giving up Ivy or Asar, which Detroit isn't willing to do, you're not getting DeJounte Murray. So I think that's just pretty much dead at this point. Yeah, if if the Pistons were extremely non-committed to Jaden Ivy, I I would be a lot more interested in DeJounte Murray. But if the Pistons are going to to really commit to Ivy here, and I think we're starting to see the positive results, as, as Jasper pointed out, of playing him alongside Kate Cunningham, uh, it just doesn't really make sense because where's the fit there? I, I do like DeJounte Murray a lot more than I like Zach Levine, just in terms of the contract and the player, what he can do, what he brings. Uh, but it just doesn't make as much sense. And it feels like those talks have really started to die off. And maybe that's more to do with just Atlanta calling and saying, look, give us Ivy Thompson and picks. And the Pistons are like, no. And the Hawks are okay. Then there's nothing else you guys have that we want. Or it might just be, look, the Pistons are seeing Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivy playing together. And they're going to commit to that for the rest of the season and, and see where that takes them. So let's talk about some of the smaller moves that are more likely. Um, the Pistons have reportedly called the Charlotte Hornets on Miles Bridges, who has gotten a lot of interest across the league um, as a heavily coveted wing. Um, I think Phoenix has been linked to him as well. Um, any quick this will be quick. Any quick thoughts on Miles Bridges? Does he help them on the court? Yes, absolutely. But do you want to deal with the the headache that is signing him, bringing him in, and all the criticism that you're going to receive for bringing in a player or a person with uh, the the charges and the the criminal offenses that he's committed? I don't really think you do. So that's kind of where I'm at on it. I, I do think he'd help them on the court, but it just seems like there's going to be uh, – some, some very significant pushback to bringing him in. And I know it's a very uh, and competitive, I guess, is, as the word I'll use, discussion between the two sides. Some do not care about the off-the-court stuff and just want to bring him in purely because he's going to help this team. And while I uh, feel for those people because I understand the desire to watch your team get better and win more games, I think you have to consider that, that type of uh, the stuff that Bridges' personal life has brought on him. And it's going to play a factor in the decision making, not just for the Pistons, but for any team that's interested in him. I feel like uh, if uh, any other player were putting up the numbers that Miles Bridges were putting up, he would be getting talked about as a much more valuable player than Bridges is. So I, I definitely feel like uh, teams around the league are noticing the the perception on Bridges, and that's played an impact in his uh, seemingly lack of value right now across the league. Bridges, I, I'll say this first off. Look, what what he did was disgusting, and for that reason alone, I would say I don't want him on my team. Um, but look, even if we put that aside, let's look at what he does on the court. He is a negative defender. He has exactly one season of his entire career uh, in, in 2020-21 season where he shot better than league average from three. For what this team needs, which is positive defenders – good on-court leadership from veteran players and shooting, he does not fit. He does not fit. And it's, it's to me, uh, it's somewhat of like a Levine light situation in the terms of like, he's also a guy who doesn't pass the ball. He needs the ball in his hands to be successful. I don't think he fits with this roster. I never have. Uh, for two years now, I've been saying I'm not interested in Miles Bridges on the Pistons. I just don't think he fits with what they need. And I don't know if he makes his bet or not, but I, if we're talking off-court stuff either, I just think it's a total no-go for me. I don't see really the upside for him in Detroit. I don't think he fits with the roster. I don't think he fits with the culture. Uh, and Frankly, from a moral perspective, he does not fit with what I want to see 
uh, from my sports teams. I know that it's sports. I know it's a business. I know that stuff doesn't matter. But guess what? To me, it does. So uh, um, that's how I feel about it. That's my personal opinion. Uh, and from a, my basketball analyst opinion as well, I just I don't see it. I, I don't see how he makes this team better. I, I see it being a similar thing to how it is in Charlotte where he scores a good amount of points because he gets the ball a lot and the team doesn't win anything ever. So no, I'm out on miles bridges. I think that will be a very interesting um, point of discussion in uh, the comments (laughs) for this, because, you know, being in a city where we, where the Cleveland Browns employ a quarterback, that's very, very, um, divisive in his actions and seeing the dichotomy there um, of very desperate to get a quarterback for the first time since the eighties and moral compass. It, it um, very, very uh, unfortunate to see some of the takes from, from people just in that situation. And it would probably be very similar with miles bridges, who is, it does have the hometown thing. Like I don't trust the Pistons to not make that part of the, you know, ploy for if they did get him, you know, that this would be a home coming of sorts, the Michigan State thing. Um, so I, I I just don't want to even entertain that that thought. It's it's just just kind of well, weirds me out. Look at how the Watson situation worked out. Joe Flacco outplayed him this year. Like <laughs> I'm not saying that Miles Bridge is gonna be like that sort of thing, but like no. I, even if you are in our comments section, forget what we're saying about our moral stances. Find me a reason Miles Bridges actually fits on this team from a basketball perspective other than, oh, he scores a lot of points. Find me one. Really, do it. I don't think you can. So I- I'm interested to see if anybody has an actual basketball counterargument to what we're saying, um, but I don't see one. I think it's pretty cl- cut and dry. So the last player that's sort of been linked to teams. And this is another guy that as soon as he was acquired, it was like, Oh, where's Monty Morris going to go? Cause he's a veteran point guard who doesn't turn the ball over the 76ers and the Suns have reported, have reportedly been linked to Morris. I just wonder if he's had enough time on the court for teams to make offers. Um, or if, uh, you know, he's more likely a guy that rides out the season um, and, you know, maybe comes back to Detroit, much like Burks. I know there was some, you know, internal discussion about, you know, keeping Burks um, because he is a good vet. You know, he's a microwave off off the bench. Morris is a very stable point guard. But um, would you guys be, uh, you know, averse to keeping him for the rest of your keeping Morris? That is, I mean, I think if you move Killian, you have to keep Monty Morris. You, you you can't trade both of them away. Then you're doing the opposite of what you did this past off season. Yeah, I think it. I think it makes sense to 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 keep Burks or keep uh, Morris. Excuse me. I also think it makes sense to look at bringing him back in the summer. Uh, short short span of games that we've seen from him. I think he's only played in four games so far. But like you can tell, what he brings to the court is valuable. Uh, even if he doesn't take a lot of shots per game, just his ability to be a veteran on the court. Uh, the bench unit at times has looked actually not too bad under his leadership. So I, I think it makes sense to keep him. It keeps Killian Hayes off the court. Uh, and there's there's a lot that's been talked about in terms of needing veterans, having veterans that can play. Monte Morris fits that bill exactly. He seems to want to be here. He's from the Flint area. was a very, very good high school player here in Michigan for uh, a few years. I think it makes sense to keep him, and I'm sure he would be interested in coming back here considering how excited he seemingly was uh, when he got traded here. I I also would like to keep Morris. Um, Look, if there's a good trade offer, if you have to throw him in in order to pull something sizable off that benefits the Pistons, so be it. But for exactly the reasons Aaron just said, uh, I would like to keep him around. Killian Hayes is done here. Uh, Marcus Sasser is not a backup point guard. He's not a point guard at all, in my opinion. So you're going to have a need for that next year, regardless of of what happens. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for Morris to be that guy moving forward. I think he is the type of player that can, you know, if you are going to stagger Cade and and Jaden Ivey's minutes, I think he fits in seamlessly with that. If you want to let either guy kind of cook on their own, um, 
or you just want him to to handle full time backup duties. He has the track record. Uh, I'm not surprised teams are calling about him. You know, I think all they really needed to see was is he healthy? He is. Cool. We're interested. And for me, while I had said like I would be okay with trading him as long as you have an adequate replacement that you bring in this off season. I'd prefer to keep him and I would prefer to extend him. I think you can keep him for pretty cheap and I think he can help out your team quite a bit moving forward. So yeah, that's how I feel about it as well. As we wrap up our uh, trade talk on the podcast, just um, not to, not to, you know, turn the rumor mill, but Quentin Grimes is out tonight for the New York Knicks in a similar uh, strange vein, both Anthony Davis and Le- LeBron James are suddenly out for the Lakers as well um, mm-hmm. in a nationally televised game against the Boston Celtics. So I'm sure the NBA is just thrilled. Using this podcast to single-handedly manifest Quentin Grimes to the Detroit Pistons and maybe LeBron and AD as well. Thank you. I was going to say, like, <laughs> we if we're going to get an a return for Bogdanovich and Burks, we got to get something sizable back in return, right? There we I, go. I think, you know two three for two swap i think that seems that seems reasonable to me we can cut alec burks in half send half of him to new york but the other half of him in uh in la i i think it could work out yeah i think it's possible um king solomon where are you at (laughs) it's that time of year though where we look at planes being chartered across the country and guys who are out with you know you know, Phi Owies or whatever, um, you know, who are suddenly no longer playing and, and just wondering if a trade's happening or not. But um, guys, that is that is our trade talk. Anything else, maybe a move you're expecting at the deadline, whether it's the Pistons or not, just something off the wall. I mean, it's been very, very oddly quiet here uh, as of late. Real quick, I'll post one final question. It can just be a, a yes or no answer. And that's all I've got for the rest of the show. Do the Pistons make another trade before the trade deadline my answer is yes yes yeah i'm saying yes as well i would agree yep i think they're going to make at least one more trade yep um okay well hearing nothing else uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the palace of pistons podcast uh once again just as we did at the top of the show um, i would like to plug our sub stack certainly subscribe to it you'll get all of our content directly to you it's our new home uh, for all of our content, make sure to follow Palace of Pistons on X slash Twitter at Palace of Pistons. Um, you can follow all of us individually as well. Uh, we will have those um, links in the description of the pod or wherever you are watching or listening to it. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to our show wherever you're listening, whether that is Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave our show rating and a review. It certainly does mean a lot um, as we continue to expand uh, and and put this show and, and all of our content on some different platforms uh, to interact with you, the fans. So that's going to do it for this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. I'd like to thank my two co-hosts, Jasper Apollonia and Aaron Johnson, for joining me as always. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsor this week as well, Bet Online, uh, And again, Bet Online. Uh, is your number one source for playoff football odds, and I'll certainly be using it for Super Bowl Sunday. So again, for my co-hosts, Jasper Apollonia and Aaron Johnson, I am Mike Anguilano. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network, and we will see you all next time.